Okay, I want to just begin by uh, thanking the Revson Foundation, uh, the Architectural League of New York, and uh, the Center for an Urban Future. It's a real pleasure to be able to start the design process with such rigorous and comprehensive research as the foundation, um, and pretty rare. <clears throat> this is a project which we're calling L+. Um, it's a collaboration between a number of different parties. Uh, I'm Brad Samuels. I'm a partner at C2 Studio. MTWTF is a graphic design firm based in Long Island City, Queens. Uh, Jessica Blaustein uh, teaches at the New School in the Media Studies Department. Lauren Comito and Christian Zabriskie are co-founders of Urban Librarians Unite, as well as being librarians within the Queens system. Um, Jesse Keenan is the research director at the Center uh, for Urban Real Estate at Columbia, and Rachel Meltzer at the Milano School, also at the New School. So what I'm going to show you today is really the result of about 10 weeks of intensive collaboration between all of us. Um, and we want to start with a very simple observation, which is that the role of the library uh, has changed, but that the space of the library desperately needs to catch up. Uh, as we think about uh, the future of branch libraries, we must address one fundamental question above all others, and that is, uh, how do we realign the design of the institution to match contemporary needs? Um, we feel like this is a, you know, a paradigm shift which needs to be addressed first uh, through a question of program, and what is the function of the library today? So although libraries still perform a, a, a provide a traditional array of services, they also increasingly offer a breadth of non-traditional programs. Uh, they function as sites of innovation uh, and programming tailored to communities' specific needs. So in short, what we found is basically that libraries literally do everything, and that this is something we need to acknowledge, it's something we need to embrace, and in this context, it's something we really need to design for. So New York, in particular, we feel needs a flexible solution uh, which can enhance the foundations of the existing systems while also providing new solutions. So L plus is a proposal for a flexible, replicable, and easily deployable system that's intended to do uh, three principal things. Uh, first, to extend the footprint uh, of the library. Second, to close service gaps. And third, uh, to basically supplement programming with new and innovative uh, types of functions. Uh, we looked at two types of locations, two typologies, one within existing libraries, so uh, branches uh, may have community rooms in which L plus could be inserted, or uh, you may have non-traditional library spaces, which we're calling outposts, uh, which could be storefronts, transportation hubs, shopping malls, et cetera. So we begin with this, this question of program. This is really where the research started. Um, and we basically took Cuff's report and we just basically uh, tried to codify all of the things the program currently offers formally. Um, book lending is not a surprise, but a lot of this was a kind of revelation for us. Early childhood development, citizenship classes, computer and digital services. Um, we then combined with that uh, sort of anecdotal evidence of what actually is happening within libraries that may not appear on the schedule. Also a very robust list. Uh, neighborhood gathering spaces, cooking classes, self-publishing help, ad hoc tech help. Um, and then finally, potential programming. You know, what could the future libraries do? Some of this is already happening in other parts of the country, but for whatever reason, it's not yet happening in New York. So co-working spaces, media labs, uh, tool lending, recording studios, maker spaces, et cetera. Um, so in this sense, we compiled a list, which it's important to point out is not comprehensive in any way. It's, it's diverse, it's a long list, but we felt like we were just really scratching the surface here. Um, Jessica Blaustein took this list and she did a really kind of interesting study of all of the kind of minutia and granular information you might need to know about when, when executing any of these programs at times of day, what constituents they might serve. And we ended up with this very long and um, somewhat unwieldy spreadsheet. Uh, so how do we turn this into a tool which becomes useful uh, for us as designers? Um, the first thing we did was to basically take the programs and to put them into subcategories. So 15 plus programs become 13 uh, overall categories. We then look at functional and technical requirements. You know, what, were the, what would be the kind of uh, things you would need to deliver to realize any of these programs, either in isolation or in combination with each other? And then ultimately what we get is a kind of revised matrix, which uh, can be thought about on the, the program type level, more granularly, uh, specific programs in the vertical axis, and then the horizontal axis, the functional and technical requirements. And the idea here is that this is and this gives us the opportunity to quickly identify what you would need as a designer, both in terms of you know, functional requirements, but also the provision of, of, of uh, you know, power, electricity, wireless provisions, uh, computers, et cetera. Um, and in, in some sense, this ends up being a kind of menu. 
And that's the idea. This is an a la carte approach, which could be drawn upon to insert any combination of these programs into a community very efficiently and effectively, and really ends up driving what we're calling this kit of parts. Uh, so here, this is a direct translation of that, that programmatic study. Um, these are components of furniture, uh, work surfaces, shelving, display, storage, uh, signage, infrastructure. Uh, any of this could be mobilized, um, depending on what the requirements were. Um, as we design this kit of parts, we, we think about two primary design considerations, uh, principally one, uh, that everything needs to be really flexible. This is all in anticipation of many different activities happening within the same space. Um, so can we make foldable chairs, foldable you know, tables, stools that stack, places to put everything, and get reconfigured to, to allow a degree of flexibility? Um, and then also infrastructure. Uh, you know, the provision of power we take for granted, but in, in the current branch libraries, people are fighting over outlets. So how do we deliver that effectively, efficiently, from you know, an infrastructure point down to a work surface as a kind of hot surface? The idea here is you should be able to reach out you know, within arm's length and plug in your laptop, or charge your phone, et cetera. So this is all kind of um, not site specific. It's decontextualized. The next, the next part of this study was choosing sites. What is the criteria for where this might make sense in the city? Um, Christian and Lauren, again, helped us uh, establish uh, you know, community rooms that might be interesting places to, to pilot this. Uh, we also looked at outposts, which are really neighborhoods that have very specific needs. And I'll come back to the criteria uh, that led us to choose these in a moment. Um, while we're doing this, Rachel Meltzer uh, did this really rigorous and uh, sort of on the ground study of what it would take to actually get this done in the neighborhoods we're talking about. Um, so she spoke to business improvement districts, she spoke to landlords, uh, she spoke to brokers, and basically, you know, created a sort of survey of the mar market logistics. Um, and the biggest takeaway here is that the city is actually an appealing tenant, which is, of course, the, needs to be the premise for everything else. Um, there were some uh, concerns about the delay in, in, in lease initiation with the city, but we thought that they could be overcome. Um, promising locations, places where you could have, uh, you know, price discounts would be fulfilling community space requirements, persistently vacant storefronts, second floor spaces that had, of course, ADA uh, compliance, nonprofit or city-owned spaces. Um, the prices, it's not a surprise, vary dramatically depending on where in the city uh, you were looking at. Um, but the partnerships, I think, was also one of the biggest takeaways. You need a really strong partner in these situations. Uh, the bids emerged here as somebody we felt could, could really efficiently and effectively implement these um, within the neighborhoods in which they themselves are situated. So back to the question of sites, how do we choose these? Um, three basic overarching categories uh, kind of emerged and reemerged. Uh, geography, so both geographic isolation, places that are cut off for whatever reason, uh, as well as points of connectivity and sort of nexus, so both transportation hubs uh, as well. Saturation was also a theme that came up a lot. Uh, this is the idea that branch libraries are frequently operating beyond their capacities. So how could you locate an outpost as a satellite within proximity, absorb some of that programming which is currently overtaxing uh, the branch and allow the branch to rededicate itself to its core competencies. And then of course community needs. Which communities might have very specific needs that could benefit from a very customizable uh, and tailored approach to reprogramming spaces. So ultimately we chose three to look at for the, case, uh, for the sake of this presentation. Um, in some sense, this is an arbitrary selection. The idea is that this is a, a replicable, scalable approach, which could be uh, implemented anywhere in the city. We basically chose these because they represented three different scales of intervention. So Astoria is a community center. This is the existing branch in Astoria. Uh, the smallest scale, Macon Branch in Bedford-Stuyvesant, medium scale, and then the Staten Island Ferry Terminal, the largest of the three. We'll start with Astoria. Uh, so this branch is located in a very uh, sort of active and diverse uh, community. It has uh, a community room that, that's, that's there, um, but it's pretty underutilized space and, and somewhat, frankly, unappealing to use currently. Um, so the question uh, for us first started on the outside of the building. How do we announce that there's this new programming that, that, that resides within? Uh, we think about signage as a way to do that, prominently displaying schedules, but we kind of extend it beyond the facade to wayfinding, basically. Uh, what we found is that the community rooms are often buried in the, in the bowels of buildings, in the back of buildings. Nobody knows where they are. Um, so a pretty you know, radical approach to either whether it's super graphics or uh, 
you know, painting the floor, et cetera, helping the visitor get from the street to, the, to this new location. Um, we then draw upon this, this, this menu, right, to identify the, the programs, and it really shouldn't be us that's identifying these. They talk about community engagement. It should be the librarians in the community that decide what, decides what needs to go there. But they could use something like this to, the, to then allow us to quickly decide what, what needs to get deployed. Um, so program selection. Uh, here we look at uh, ESOL classes, story time, and startup. And I'll just play a quick animation. So a large immigrant population in Astoria um, would make sense to have ESOL classes there. Uh, you know, the story time and the, the startup classes were all kind of chosen partially because it's a really diverse and flexible uh, sort of arrangement just for the sake of presentation here. Um, so ESOL classes, what would that look like? Perhaps a more conventional setup, long desks, uh, somebody leading a class at the front, um, story time, the desks go away, the chairs are folded up, they're put in the closet, and stools which were previously stacked come out and get arrayed um, fairly easily. And then finally, a uh, startup consult. Maybe those desks are re-aggregated in smaller clusters with facilitated workshops. A closet is open that contains AV equipment and printers and things that might be used by you know, entrepreneurs um, and the like. <clears throat> so Macon Branch and Outpost is a second case study. Uh, so this is not an existing, this is an outpost that's in relation to an existing branch. Um, Macon is a, is a Carnegie branch which was renovated in 2006 but currently plays host, uh, basically functions as a teen center on top of all of its other programming. So is there a scenario in which you could, you know, locate an outpost nearby within proximity and absorb some of that young adult programming? So here we found a, a retail space uh, that might make sense um, within, you know, a few, basically a block. Uh, and again, we think about it first from the outside. How do we announce to the community that this is there, this is a resource, is it signage? Is it a mural or a super graphic of some sort? Um, but then also, really important, the schedule. How do we prominently display a schedule in the, in the window, not just to deliver the basic information of what's happening at what time, but to be large enough and designed enough to really become iconic, this idea of a user-generated content somehow representing uh, this outpost in the community. Of course, then it becomes easy to distribute that same type of information across platforms. Uh, and again, we look at a series of different uh, programs, in this case, uh, skewed towards a, a young adult demographic, the teen center, makerspace, we feel like would be something that would be really well used in this community, um, and then cooking classes, which you've heard about today, uh, occurring already in the libraries around New York, perhaps a bit more informally. Um, so first, the makerspace. Uh, we're showing this here with the kind of infrastructure integrated, and this is in anticipation of inheriting spaces which may not you may not want to open the walls, you may not want to deal with you know, what's, what's above the ceiling and all the kind of bird's nest of electrical and et cetera. Perhaps you're just bringing in this, this infrastructure and you're providing points of connectivity. You see someone here plugging in uh, their soldering iron, there's someone with a 3D printer nearby, a large work surface and a closet which has all of the tools. Uh, again, the community center rearranges those desks into smaller clusters. Um, and then finally, the cooking class, which we feel like there's probably going to be opportunities here to take advantage of existing infrastructure. This may have been a restaurant, we don't know. If it was, why not keep the sink, why not keep the hood, um, and, and make it a kind of formal offering of, of, of this outpost. We also think this is an interesting uh, a potential opportunity to involve the community in the facilitation of these types of activities. So you see here someone conducting a cooking class that maybe is not a, mem a, a, a staff of, of the BPL. Um, we feel like this could also sort of, you know, involve the community, but also uh, unload some of the pressure on, on staffing. Finally, uh, St. George, uh, the Library Center and Outpost. This is in Staten Island. Again, an existing branch, the St. George uh, Library Center, which offers great service to the local community, but also exists in, in close proximity to, this, to the ferry terminal, Staten Island Ferry Terminal. Um, a very interesting sort of uh, set of folks we'd be serving here. This is a commuter population. They're here in 30-minute blocks. It's also the third most visited tourist attraction, or tour tourist site in the city, mostly for the ride on the ferry. Um, but basically a captive audience and a transient audience. Um, so in this case, we're, we're placing the outpost in the center of this waiting area. Um, it's, a, it's a standalone structure. And again, we think about programming that might make sense uh, for this 
sort of population that's in flux. Uh, we look to an ex exhibition space first. So of course, the, the primary idea behind the infrastructure is to deliver power and lighting, et cetera, but it also becomes a kind of framework uh, upon which revolving exhibitions could be mounted and displayed. You see the carts of books coming out of the outpost, extending the footprint uh, uh, in this location. Uh, here, uh, lectures, tutorials would have to be very concise and, and punchy lectures for these kind of 30-minute blocks, but a screen would drop down and you'd have someone presenting. Um, in the foreground, and I want to just pause and talk about this for a moment, you see uh, stack, you know, carts that have books on them. We've got two ideas about how we would uh, work with collections here. One, um, we feel like Staten Island in particular would be a major point for pickup and drop off. So we really you know, use the floating collection um, to its full capacity here. And that's something in, in Astoria, in Macon, and in this case, we would plan to do and throughout. Um, but also a kind of carefully curated and site-specific collection of books that would, uh, could be lent, but would always come back to this place. And we feel like this is an important uh, counterpoint to the floating collection to help provide sort of identity um, for the community it serves. And then finally, the performance space. This is an interesting possibility because it, sh it potentially combines formal and informal activities. Um, you know, you might have scheduled performances, uh, but you could probably just as easily imagine ad hoc uh, informal performances occurring in a transportation hub. Um, here we've created a set of bleachers, uh, which would allow people to you know, sit, wait for the ferry, watch the performance, but also plug in um, and use their laptops to get some work done as well. So in conclusion, uh, we really are thinking about this L plus approach as an efficient and affordable alternative to constructing new ground up buildings. Um, we feel like the lower uh, financial and, and frankly political thresholds that might be required to do some of this present opportunities to really incubate some of these ideas, um, to test them, to fail, uh, but hopefully to codify and establish the, you know, the new programming that will be the future of branch libraries. Um, so in this sense, while we, while we certainly feel like uh, there's a future for grand central libraries, uh, we feel like the future of the branch library is not monumental. Rather, it is distributed and it is magnetic. Thank you. <laughs>